comes down from your internal team and your external team. You want people that have successfully performed in the past, both on your internal team and your external team, because they're going to be able to give you good, reasonable expectations and also good, reasonable solutions in any and every environment, because we can all overreact. And sometimes the best case to do is just stop, take a moment, take a deep breath, understand all the drivers that are happening right now so you don't make a rash reaction. That was Jason Yerusi, managing member of Yerusi Holdings. Now this is Jason's second visit to the show and things have changed quite a bit since he was on the first time. So stay tuned as we navigate the current market. Now let's get into the show. The limited partner shares in the potentially outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment, but as a passive investor and has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time. And that is why we're here together. 90% of the millionaires out there built their net worth with real estate. However, 0% of the billionaires are hands-on managing the real estate assets because there simply isn't enough time. My name is Jake Wiley, and for the past 16 years, I've been investing in real estate, and I've learned a thing or two. But the most important lesson is how to leverage the expertise and time of others to maximize your investment potential. Welcome to the Limited Partner Podcast. All right, partners, this is your host again, Jake Wiley. I'm joined by Jason Yerusi, might be a familiar face. We've had him on the show before, but uh, we're going to have a slightly different conversation today. But Jason, welcome to the show. Jake, I'm excited to be back. Thank you for having me. We'll get into it quickly here in a minute. But for those of you out there that haven't met Jason, I'll give you a, a quick second to give a quick background on who you are, Yerusi Holdings, and anything else you think might be relevant. Yeah, sure. Great to be back. Jason Yerusi, managing partner here at Yerusi Holdings with my wife, Pili Yerusi. We have acquired a little over 2,000 units since 2017, predominantly in the Southeast, mainly targeted between Louisville, Nashville, and Atlanta. Of those 21, 22 acquisitions, we've now gone full cycle on 10, soon to be 11, and possibly 12 of them. We're continuing to really push forward in a pretty interesting market right now. Yeah, you bring up a great point, right? It is an interesting market and things are changing relatively quickly. And, you know, the, I've had a bunch of conversations recently thinking through what's coming. Nobody's got a crystal ball, but I think what is important is that maybe for the past almost decade, we've been in this just kind of rising tide environment. There's been a lot of players that have jumped into the market that maybe don't have the experience and or the team and have been successful because of everybody's winning. The market's changing quickly, very rapidly here. Interest rates are going up. Banks like don't even really know what to do. I mean, I think the interest rate capped rates are so high now that like they're cost prohibitive. But what I really want to focus on today is, you know, one of the pillars of investing as a limited partner in, in assets is really the sponsor, right? So the three pillars are we've got the sponsor, we've got the actual market itself, right? So there's a micro and macro market. And then outside of that, we've got the asset class. So like, what are you investing in, right? So you, you pick one, but today I really want to focus on kind of the, the sponsor, the general partner and helping to find the right one to work with, especially in this market. So Jason, I'd love to get your take, you know, high level, what do you think that looks like? If somebody's out there looking to find a sponsor, you know, what should they be looking for? Sure, great question. So when you look into this space, the sponsor is a main driver, right? They're going to be the ones who are gonna find a deal, structure a deal, put together the deal, carry out the business plan, the deal, and hopefully create a great investment for themselves and yourself as the investor. However, before you start that road, you have to ask some questions of yourself. Ultimately, what is your goal with making this investment? What is that big overarching goal? Are you looking for day one cash flow? Are you looking for a big driver being the cash flow proponent? And you're not so worried about a big upside in the back. Are you okay for maybe limited cash flow? And you're looking for a bigger payoff down the road based on potentially forced appreciation that could maybe even put you in a fact of looking into more development. Or are you a kind of hindering between cash flow and appreciation is important, but one of the big drivers potentially is some tax advantages or for some of the appreciation benefits you can get. That's going to be one of the big questions. What is your ultimate goal for making this investment? And are you okay for having your money into an investment for three, five, seven years? Next question is going to be, where do you want to invest? Are you comfortable investing in only primary markets or markets that are very close to you? Or do you want to invest in secondary and tertiary markets? Are you okay investing in some of these not dominant markets or not notably most mentioned markets like your Chicago, your New York City, your Miami, your Los Angeles? Are you okay to go into 
other markets that may not be in the news each and every day, but are still leading the pack. And then past that, are you only going to invest in one market? Are you open to being into many markets? Because that's going to help you on your due diligence. So are you going to be driving your due diligence on naming the market and finding an investor in that market or finding an investor or a sponsor that you like working with? And then you can be open to where they go for the market. Now, from a sponsor side, one of the important questions can be, what is their track record? That can be a double-sided sword or a double-sided bladed sword, right? Because in that fact, if they're new to the space, well, what are their supporting team members or what has been their current success or past success in other businesses or other ventures? Have they always basically done what they've said they're going to do? Because that's a big driver for how they're going to perform today. How do you know this person? What has been your connection with this person? What has been some of the pearls that you've spoken to on this person? And do you see their business plan? Does their business plan make sense to you? Are they going to go in there and do X and that's going to produce Y results? Does that make sense to you? And if you can start putting it in from the goals to where you want to be and how long you're able to be there for it, and the person you're going to align with is going to help you make very clean, clear decisions on if, in fact, a sponsor may, in fact, be right for you on this investment and potentially more into the future. Yeah, I mean, those are great points because the sponsor is really responsible for executing the entire business plan. And, you know, I think they're selling you on the business plan. And I think that's really important is that you've got to have some underlying ideas of what you're comfortable with, but then, you know, the sponsor's really going to be bringing what is the asset? Why this asset? Why this market? What is their experience? There's a lot to that, right? And especially in this current market, maybe might be easier to even ask the question of like, what's changed, right? From a sponsor perspective, what should they be talking about now in this rising interest rate environment with a little bit of uncertainty in the future that maybe they weren't sharing before? You want to see preparation and not overreacting. Because if you think about it, where we were are today, where we were a year ago, where we were a couple of years ago in the COVID, where we were five years ago today, it's moved so quick and it's changed so fast that if you overreacted at any point, you were be going to be on the other side of a good decision. So you want to see that they have a business plan in place that they've thought through where potentially different changes in the environment could affect the business plan and that their business plan allows them for multiple options to be able to make good choices based on different market dynamics that occur into the future. Yeah, and I guess you have some really good examples of something that you would wanna see. Sure, so let's think about right now, you're taking on debt. Ultimately, if you're pushed to be able to make decisions based only on the loan, because the loan's pushing you to make a decision, it's going to limit you on what you can do and how you can react to the market. On the other side of it, you want to think about how high interest rates are today. So if you were to take on a loan and say it's a Fannie or Freddie loan and you're at you know 7% on that loan today, and it's got a very prohibitive prepayment penalty and your business plan wants to be open to be able to capitalize on changes in the market, but whether negative or positive here, well, that business plan may be affected by the prepayment penalty into that loan. If your plan is really to continue pushing forward with very massive rent increases, where you have to hit these massive rent increases for this deal to even make sense, noting how high rents have gone and noting that we potentially might find ourselves into recession, I may want to think twice about working with that group because ultimately I may be capped by things that are outside of the business plans like approach right there. You may see a lot of jobs and a lot of employers potentially start pulling back and maybe some of where the workforce housing gets affected, right? And so if you think about that, how does that affect our tenant base when you see things like the supermarkets or, or, thing, or places like Walmart or Target not bringing on all these seasonal employees that usually give the bump to some of these work people People that are predominantly driven into the workforce housing, and that may affect ultimately how they're able to perform by paying the rent each and every month. You, you brought up two really good points there. I mean, more than that, but like two that I really want to key in on is one is debt, right? So debt is such a big piece of the puzzle right now. And there's a lot of things that you, know, you as an investor should be thinking about. So the interest rates are rising. So I don't think there's anybody out there in the world that anticipates that they just go up and then they just stay up. Like people are assuming that they're going to come back down. Now, when that's going to happen, we don't know. But most likely it's the hope in, is that it's going to happen within probably the business plan. But because of the way debt is structured right now and banks don't know what to do, you brought up such a crucial point is that there may be prepayment penalties associated with the debt that almost makes it prohibitive 
like let's just say it's at seven percent and it drops back down to four like you may not even be able to take advantage of that because of the prepayment penalties and that's real and then on the flip side like starting on you know this side is saying like hey i'm afraid that the interest rates are going to go way up there's a way you can buy caps on you know the interest rate and those may be cost prohibitive or they may be very expensive so when you're looking at a business plan and there's this, well, okay, in two years, we're going to refinance and we anticipate that the rates are going to go back down. Was well, that even realistic? It's possible that maybe even the sponsor doesn't know, or he's playing a little bit of a games <laughs> with the numbers. Yeah. Did you feel like, yeah, that'll be fine, but actually they can't do that. So I think that's a really great point that like as a, a limited partner right now, I'd be looking at debt. Anything that has to do with debt and any plans, future thoughts on what's going to happen with a debt market. I would want to see what is the sponsor thinking is going to happen and what are some of the ramifications and like looking at prepayment penalties, like those are real. What's interesting is that you do have to continue to have as many banking conversations as possible. Just because rates are going up, there's still some banks lending out of their own terms right now. We got quoted the other day, basically a five and a half, you know, fixed it. It's five-year term. Of course, amortizations, it, it's local banks. So amortization is 20, right? However, it's one-year IO, five, five, where, you know, today we're prime 625, right? So if we look at that, you know, they're giving me prime at a discount based on because of just they're lending off their balance sheet. Right. So there are still bank options out there. And that's why it's important to continue to make connections because not every bank is just going to be the exact same thing. It's like if you, you know, went to a job to do some task and you only had one tool, right? You need a screwdriver and you only have a hammer, right? That's like if you're just looking at one bank and saying, okay, let's see what this bank can do. I guess that's everybody. Yeah. That's key. I mean, that's a lot of work, right? In, in the past, like you just kind of went out to the market and you found rates, but yeah, community banks, local banks. They yep. have the option to do things that maybe they didn't in the past. But again, then now you're talking about track record because they're not just going to lend like that to anybody, right? Yep. The other point you brought up, which I want to hammer a little bit harder on too, is rent increases over the past couple of years have been historically high. And, you know, I think there's a typical tendency when you're kind of putting performance together and looking into the future, you just kind of project off of what recent history has shown. And, you know, you'd be like, hey, look, for the past couple of years, but I mean, we're talking about rent increases in like 20s, 30% in some markets. That's kind of hard to imagine persisting into the future. And, you know, the rents are one of the main drivers of the values and the success of these properties over the whole period, right? And if you've got, you know, we've had 20, 30% rent increases over the past couple of years, and you've got projections that are, you know, maybe even tempered off of that a little bit, but still pretty high, that would be a moment that I would pause, right? And look at him like, oh, you know, like, I'd almost consider maybe flat would be right, but you've got to look at those things. You know, I saw a couple interesting facts. One being that over the course of last year, only 50% of apartment owners had a rent increase. I thought that was an interesting fact. And then I saw another one that, you know, the current world real estate market stands at like 10.2 trillion. I may be slightly off in that number. And in the course of the next 10 years, it's estimated the value of the current real estate market is going to be 35 trillion. That was also a weird, a weird thing that caught my eye out of CNBC today, right? And so if you look at that and you say, wow, so what does that mean? Well, either debt gets cheaper, right? So it brings returns up or people, the cap rates start compressing just massively, right? Because people are willing to just take much lower return out of the gate here. Or there's other things that keep pushing up, right? Being like on rent values. And that said, yes, rent values and rent levels have increased dramatically. But the thing to say is that can that continue? Probably not at that pace, right? It's going to price a lot of people out, but you have to make sure that you probably will still continue to have a rent increase, but your expenses increase too. It's not just a one-sided coin right there. And many times you see the fact where you think rents are the driving factor right there, but expenses are right there behind them. Everything from your labor to, you know, your maintenance work, your leasing person to your utility bills, everything has gone up. The cost of materials, everything has continued to go up here. So you have to make sure you're tracking here that rents are going to go up because unfortunately we have just a lack of supply. So people are going to be pushed to stay in housing longer and rent longer because they can't get out there to buy a house because it just doesn't make any sense. They can't afford it. doesn't make sense. They can't get a mortgage and work for their loans. So they're going to push to rent longer. So it's going to put more downside pressure on the demand for rental here because there's just no rentals. I think most can say right now today that most of their apartment complexes are occupied at a pretty substantial rate. And it's another driver for them to continue to push rates because they're occupied at the level they are. So let's push on that a little bit too, because that is, it's bandied about it is almost universal. Is it like, Hey, there's a housing shortage, rent's going up, but there's also a difference between looking at that in a macro environment, which is probably generally true. And then the micro environment, which is case by case dependent. And I think that the reason we bring this up, because we're kind of getting into this market conversation, 
But what I want to do is I want to focus on that, the sponsor aspect of it, because the sponsor is supposed to be looking at these things and saying, yes, just because just pick a random MSA, Dallas, Fort Worth, right? There's a housing shortage. That doesn't mean that every single apartment in area in Dallas, Fort Worth is going to be experiencing the same you know, growth, right? So I think that you got to be careful. And I think that's something else that the sponsors should be able to articulate very well is, you know, here's a general trend. Let's boil it down to something that's actually very specific to this market. But how do you feel about that? Jobs and jobs diversity. You know, if you think about that right now today, like jobs, what are the jobs here? What's the diversity of jobs that, that are the employers right there that are going to continue to push people to this area, right? Because you're very right is that sure, we can't do a blanket statement across the country, right? We're going to be very market driven, but within our markets, there's going to be certain parts of the market that are going to be better drivers for the particular assets that we're seeking that are going to have a higher demand for occupancy based on location. And that location is going to drive the jobs and it's going to be supported by the schools there. So if you can continue to look to say, okay, why are going to, people going to continue to come here? Well, it's going to be that they have employment. Okay, well, do, where is our pressures or where are the risk points from these employers? Is there one employer that if they go out, it's going to take down the entire sector? Or is it that, you know, we have multitude of employers and no one sector over 20% here that's going to continue to bring people here. And even if one has a dip, we're going to be well sustained by all the other ones that surround. Yeah, great points. And I think that the sponsor, right, you know, the GP, the syndicator, however you want to refer to it, should be driving those conversations with you, right? Like you yep. should be very clear if you're looking at a potential investment, how all that stuff's coming together and getting very specific, right? Like if we just Correct. do really big, broad brushstrokes, like you can almost make that statement about anywhere in the country, but we all know that's not how the market actually works. You mentioned this kind of in your opening statement, but the team. Right. Like a lot of us have not lived through a commercial cycle similar to 2008 yet. How are you looking at that? And how are folks able to augment their, I guess, their business with their team and bringing in the right folks? Honestly, it comes down from your internal team and your external team. You want people that have successfully performed in the past, both on your internal team and your external team, because they're going to be able to give you good, reasonable expectations and also good, reasonable solutions in any and every environment. Because we can all overreact and sometimes the best case to do is just stop, take a moment, take a deep breath, understand all the drivers that are happening right now so you don't make a rash reaction. We saw a lot of rash reactions during COVID. We see a lot of rash reactions from banks even today right now because they don't know in this level of uncertainty. And honestly, if it stays uncertain like it is right now, the banks will get used to the uncertainty and come back to the table just like they did in COVID, right? However, right now, because so many things are fluid and so many things are changing, they can't just get used to any kind of chaos. So they're still in that level of chaos, right? So you, if you can think about that, how can I continue to create great relationships? One being bankers, one continue to have conversations with brokers that are still trying to get out there to make money, continue to find your insurance partners, continue to find people on your team, whether it's your uh, in-house team or your external team members or just the other team members that help you, whether it be from underwriting, whether it be from asset management, from due diligence, from capital raising, from all those different perspectives is going to make you the strongest player when opportunity exists or with your current opportunities that you have today. Yeah. I just wanted to highlight that point is that yes, there's an internal team and theoretically yep. like you're working with a great team that knows what they're doing and they've experienced success. But there's a much broader team, which is who are we working with in a broader perspective? I mean, you've got legal advice, you've got accounting advice, you've got local brokers, you've got local bankers who've, a lot of these folks have seen a cycle. They've seen these things. And, you know, yeah. as you think about who's on your team, like I would encourage those that are you that are listening to ask those questions of the syndicators and the sponsors that you're working with is who is on this broader team? You know, who else are you talking with? What are you hearing in the marketplace? Because it's those conversations that will lead to one, opportunities, and two, just understanding that real estate's going to persist, right? Like it's not going away. This has happened before. It'll happen again. And the more people that you're talking with and the more experience that you basically get to claim for your team, you know, the better off you're going to be and the decisions you're going to make. And I think that's a key point. Okay, if somebody's just highlighting, hey, this is my internal team and we've got, you know, 25 years collective experience. It was like, well, who else? Like, are you not talking to anybody else? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a huge part right there is that you want to continue to have good conversations with good trusted people because it's going to continue to push you to be at your best spot to make good decisions for anything that's today or into the future. Okay. Well, I'll get back to the, the question I started to ask and then interrupted myself, but you know, what else should we be looking for, right? What else is like a hot ticket item to working with the sponsor to helping identify the right ones to work with right now? 
Honestly, you want to make sure that they are in this for the long haul. It's a very attractive space. There's a lot of people who want to get into this space. And with just everything that happens from a social media mindset is that you see so many things of people jumping around that they're into 15 different businesses all at the same time. So you want to make sure that their energy is here, that they're going to have the best goal in mind, meaning for the investment and the investors that they not only can preserve capital, but they can return capital and they can return on capital. That's the biggest drivers for you to have successful investment for, to them today and into the future. That's a great answer. And it's super timely because I actually had a conversation yesterday with somebody that, that reached out to me and, you know, it's a great conversation. And they're like, Hey, you know, I've been interested in getting into putting together a syndication for a while. And I was like, well, yeah, that's wonderful. But I was like, let's talk about what that means. Right. Cause I've been down this road before and you know, what I found quickly, it cost me, you know, some time and energy and I'm glad I went through this exercise, but it's a marriage. When you think about putting a deal together, raising money, going out and investing in apartments or multifamily, multifamily storage, whatever you may want to do three, five, seven years, like you're married to this thing. And you got to know that's what you really want to do. And to your point, yeah, it is super attractive. Like the, some of the numbers are great. Yeah. And kind of like the opening credits here is that 90% of the millionaires are out there are made through real estate. Yeah, super attractive. It is something that like you need to be committed to and you got to know what your role is because like, yeah. you know, I can be a great capital raiser, but does that make me a great diligence guy or... Does that make me the right person to operate and manage the properties? Like, no, it doesn't. So am I trying to wear all three of those hats? Like, am I going to be good at it? Mm, probably not. <laughs> so I think you raise a great point is that it's super attractive for people to get into this industry, but you really need to find somebody that this is where they want to be. This is where they've been. And like, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, 100% agree. Well, I guess to kind of close this out, is there anything else, you know, on your mind that you think that would kind of help put a bow on this conversation? Just have patience in your approach, right? There's always more investments. If there's something that you're not ready to invest today, that's fine, right? Keep asking questions until you learn better questions to ask so you can get better answers. And so as a you know, limited partner, as a passive investor, we want you to be able to make a good decision because just like you said, this is not a 20 day investment. This could be a one, three, five, 10 year investment, depending on the investment in hand. So you want to make sure that you're making a great decision that you've asked the right questions. So you can feel very solid with your investment, not only making it today, but when you think and forecast yourself three or five years out. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, again, that, that one hits home for me too, because you know, I started this journey and I don't necessarily recommend this for everybody, but like I started a podcast to start asking these questions to illuminate, like what is the best of the best look like and how do you do that? And, you know, and I found that really early on that it led to a lot more questions and it's led to a lot of conversations. And for me, it's been great. Like, I love the fact that we get to have this conversation because this is improving my education and my confidence in the investments that I'm making. But you know, not everybody's going to go out and start a podcast to force themselves to have hundreds of conversations, but like you, you need to get to a point because it's the intent here is to be passive, right? Like you find the right yeah. partners to work with. You hand the keys over. You are not responsible for, nor do you have any right to be involved in the day-to-day -day running of these, these projects, but yeah. you're handing over your money and you work for it. It took you years, right? You put it aside. You don't want to just like hand it over willy nilly. So that takes some time. But then the whole purpose of this conversation is when you find the right sponsor that know what they're doing, that can help identify the right markets, the right asset, you're in a really, really good spot, right? And then you are passive and you can feel very comfortable with what you're doing, but you got to take the time to ask the questions and get to the point where you feel comfortable, right? And like, there's a point, you know, that everybody that's out there has had that moment in time where they're like, you know what? I've asked enough questions. And I'm ready to move forward. And I'm not talking about necessarily with this, but it could be buying a car, it could be anything. But you know what sure. it feels yeah. like. Get there, right? Like, right. don't leave this to a hope and a prayer, especially in today's market, you know, where like things are changing rapidly. There's going to be some players that aren't here tomorrow. And like, you don't want to yeah. be investing with those guys. <laughs> 100%. That's great points. Well, Jason, as usual, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be back. Awesome. I guess just for the listeners out there, how can they reach out to you if they want to find you? Sure. Go over to yurusiholdings.com. Best place to learn more about myself and our company, or you can email me directly at jason at yurusiholdings.com. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Thank you.
I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and I'd actually love for you to contribute to a future episode. If you have a question you'd like answered or a topic or a guest to bring on the show, please email me at jake at thelimitedpartner.com. Now I realize there's a lot of lingo that's thrown around on these shows, so I've created a cheat sheet for you with the top 26 terms that come up most often. Head on over to thelimitedpartner.com forward slash lingo for the list. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time.